Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to today's lecture as part of the Sustainability Council's lecture series. I'm Akang Shayola and I use she, her pronouns, and I work at the Sustainability Council at the University of Alberta. Today, we will hear from Dr. Paul Galpern. I would like to start today's lecture with a treaty acknowledgement. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located in Amiskwachi Waskahegan, which is situated on Treaty 6 territory. This land is the ancestral space of the Papas Chase Cree and Metis Nation and the traditional territory of Nitstapi, Nehiawa, Dene, Stony Nakoda, Anishinaabe, and many other in Indigenous peoples whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. As a settler and a woman of color myself, I continue to reflect on what it means to live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory, and I'm committed to growing my knowledge and understanding of these important histories and how I can honor the gifts of these lands. The Sustainability Council works with all faculties at our university to spark learning, discovery, and citizenship for sustainability. We offer courses and experiential learning opportunities for students, support sustainability-related research, put on a sustainability awareness events, and engage with the broader community on sustainability initiatives. The lecture series is a bi-weekly event which highlights sustainability research, teaching, and innovation over a range of topics with the goal of generating conversation on sustainability across disciplines. We are hosting a diverse group of speakers from both the University of Alberta and beyond to cover a number of topical issues related to sustainability and sustainable development. Upcoming lecture topics include an oil resistance story and building equity in planning practice. Please follow the link in the chat to see all of the upcoming lecture series talk. To find out more about the Sustainability Council's events and opportunities, please feel free to browse our website and sign up for a newsletter. I will include these links in the chat as well. Now, without further ado, I want to take this time to introduce Dr. Paul Galpern. Dr. Paul Galpern is an Associate Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at University of Calgary, where he is a landscape ecologist and conservation biologist working chiefly in prairie croplands and rangelands. An active area of research is investigating windmills, where both agricultural and conservation objectives can be achieved at the same time. He is also a PI on the Prairie Precision Sustainability Network, which maps unprofitable farmland land across Alberta and Saskatchewan to support its conversion to habitat. We'll be holding a Q&A session after Dr. Galpern's presentation, so please put your questions in the chat. Let's uh, give a round of applause and welcome Dr. Galpern. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I am very uh, glad to be here and uh, honored to be invited. Um, I'm going to do my best to uh, talk to you uh, about and share my excitement um, for our work uh, that brings together precision agriculture and precision sustainability. Uh, and we do that through the lens of what we call messy fields. And I'm going to talk about all these concepts in a minute. But before I get to that, a few preliminaries. Uh, first off, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my funders um, for this work. Uh, Canola Council, Ducks Unlimited, and NSERC have been uh, very um, instrumental. I'd also like to acknowledge my lab here at the University of Calgary. We run the Agriculture, Biodiversity, and Conservation Lab. Uh, and the work I'm sharing today is the product of many uh, individuals' hard work, both students and postdocs. So um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional territories that uh, I am on right now in, in Calgary, the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Bikani, Gainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. And the city of Calgary, where I am at the moment, is also home to Métis, to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. 
and I will uh, do my best to honor these lands uh, in uh, the work that follows. So uh, the land that I, uh, I'll be talking about is chiefly Alberta today, but I want to just start by um, uh, zooming out a bit to the prairies. Uh, and if you look at all the yellow dots on this map, the yellow and orange dots, each of those represents a crop field in the Canadian prairies. And if you take every single one of those crop fields and you put them edge to edge to edge to edge, and you line them all up like a great big uh, blanket, uh, quilt if you like, they all add up to 520,000 square kilometers. That's a huge area. So that's just fields that are actually in rotation, that are cropped every year. That's an area 92 times the size of Prince Edward Island, if that's a meaningful comparison to you. Or maybe more meaningful is that if you took all those yellow dots and you stacked them on top of each other, it would almost fill up Saskatchewan. That's a lot of land that is in annual crops. And to me, that is an opportunity, an opportunity for sustainability and an opportunity for biodiversity conservation. And we bring these ideas together through the lens of what uh, is increasingly being called precision conservation. Let's talk about that. So um, you may not be aware of this. Uh, some of the audience, I understand, are, are from uh, agricultural uh, uh, backgrounds. But um, some of you may not be aware that uh, combined harvesters like this one on the left are um, uh, contain on them uh, onboard monitors. So these are like little uh, GPS devices that every second records the coordinates of that harvester on the field and at the same time measures how much crop is passing over a sensor. So this allows us to detect which parts of the field are producing more crop and which parts are producing less crop at harvest time. And we can make maps like this one on the right, uh, where red suggests areas that are less productive, that produce less crop, and yellow, those areas that produce more crop. And you can see typically along the edges of the field, the crop doesn't do so well, it's exposed. And we have this area here, uh, about 1% of this total field area, which um, tends to not be in, do, to do so well, as far as the farmer's concerned, not producing as much crop. Uh, and this area could potentially be that way year over year. Maybe it's saline. Maybe the soil is salty. It has too much water in it. It's infertile. There's lots of other factors that could be at, at work here, uh, making that part of the field low productivity. And what precision conservation, uh, the goal is, is to try and understand um, which parts of fields are consistently poorly productive so that we can suggest, and that's a key word, suggest to farmers and producers and other land use decision makers, alternative land uses. So let's dig in a bit deeper. Let's imagine that uh, we take that blanket, that quilt, of uh, fields, that 520,000 square kilometers of fields across the prairies. And we assume, just pick a number, 6% of an average field is performing below average. It's costing the farmer to farm that land. They're spending money on pesticides. They're spending money on fertilizers. They're spending money on seeds. They're spending money on fuel. And at the end of the day, that blue spot of the land, if you like, is not returning their investment. It is loss for them. Well, um, if we make this assumption, 6%, it's a, it's a very broad assumption, I'll admit that, but we roll that assumption account across Prairie Canada, Canada that amounts to 31,000 square kilometers of land. That's five times Prince Edward Island, or something like seven million acres of land. Now, you, maybe you don't trust the 6% number, but uh, and in fact, we don't really have good estimates of how much of an average field is performing below average. Um, but we, we, we do know that some parts of the prairies that have been examined, as much as 15% of the field in parts of Saskatchewan may be marginally productive. So I just 
we don't know these numbers yet. And indeed, a lot of the work we're doing in my lab, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is to try to better estimate these numbers. But I want to just say this to indicate the potential. If we can convince farmers to take that little blue area out of production to save money, not at any cost to them, to save money, we have opportunities associated with that land. And we're going to talk about those opportunities. Let's just dig in just a tiny bit deeper to how this process might work for a farmer. So we have, uh, let's say we can make a map of, of how much seed the farmer spends on, on her land and how much fertilizer he applies to different parts of the field, and then how much yield she gets from the crop, where each color indicates how much uh, crop passes across that harvester. And we combine that with the annual costs of inputs like fertilizer and seed and, and uh, fungicide and, and, and pesticide. And we combine that with the annual market price for the crop and we put all those pieces together, but we do this over 10 years because we don't just care about the one year in which we were profitable or unprofitable, but we do it across a 10 year time series. And then we can go back to the farmer and say, hey, this little part of your field, it's underperforming. Maybe it's time to do some precision conservation. So let's say you convince farmers to do this. So what? Well, that's what I'm gonna focus on next. It comes down to what I like to call the merits of making fields messy. What do we mean by mess? Well, on the left, you have what I would call tidy fields. These are very typical central southern Alberta uh, fields. Um, you know, you might find them south of Calgary towards Lethbridge, quarter sections in which every field is cropped right to the, bar the, the, the margins of the Dominion Land Survey set out in the 19th century that carved these prairies up into these nice little squares. And every single bit of that field has been, uh, been, been cultivated to the very edge. Not so common as you get up closer to Edmonton where you have a much more parkland landscape. But I would say uh, on the right here, I would call these messy fields. So if the same, um, dimensions, these are equivalent to two uh, uh, to four sections, 3,200 meters on a side. And you can see there's a lot more stuff going on in that map. And that stuff, that mess, is what I call conservation sustainability potential. So, um, you know, uh, we talk to farmers and some might say, this is how I stay in business. But others might say, perhaps this is more sustainable. So, um, let's just unpack, uh, um, you know, the types of mess, if you like, a catalog of the messy features we might find in Alberta fields across, or the prairie fields across, uh, not just Alberta, but 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 uh, the the entire region. So in southeast Alberta, you might see um, pivot uh, irrigation, and the corners of those fields are uncultivated, and in there therein lies an opportunity. I've mentioned central Alberta or in southern Alberta already. Look at that. That's four sections that is just one big field, except for these areas where there's a little bit of mess. These are wetlands, opportunities for sustainability and conservation. Western Manitoba, much more complicated landscape. Southeastern Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and then Central Alberta. And here is a typical shot of a canola field in bloom. Things like pivot corners, shelter belts, fence rows, road margins, pasture, low spot, stream margins, all of these are part of the catalog of opportunities in this region. Um, and, you know, this is an extreme shot, but it's worth mentioning that much of the prairie is also aligned with the prairie pothole region, which is filled with these wetlands. So let's just zoom in, right? Reminding of the context here, can we convince farmers that it's worth it to remove land from production and if we do, what could we gain? Let's talk biodiversity, potential gains here. Messy places like this wetland, like other perennial features that the farmer might remove from production on her field are hotspots for ecosystem services. So um, in the grassland surrounding this wetland, we might have 
reservoirs of natural enemies, the beetles, the spiders, the harvestmen that are going to head out into that crop and eat the pests. We call them natural enemies because they are doing that ecological function to help control pests on the field. We might also have flowers and uh, on, the, uh, on this uncultivated area that isn't annually cropped that are providing foraging opportunities. That's nectar and pollen for up to 400 bee species in Alberta and ground nesting spots. These bees need to nest in the ground. They build, if you like, their, their nest in the ground. Uh, and th this undisturbed land is key to that. Further out in the field, you're gonna to have tons of soil disturbance, whether that's the seed drill or it's the tire tracks, or um, you know, in some fields, it could be tillage. Uh, so if this, this landscape is a, is, is a patchwork of opportunities and at the center of it is things like this wetland and its surrounding uncultivated margins, opportunities for sustainability, opportunities for conservation. Let's unpack those opportunities in the language of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the things that nature gives to people. Uh, and we can classify them. You know, the messy field at the bottom left, those patches of trees, the wet, surrounding wetlands, uh, typical landscape you might find near Edmonton. Um, they're providing things like pollination services, pest control services. Those are the words we use for bees flying out and doing stuff to plants or uh, spiders marching into the crop and eating the bad guys. Um, and also, key to this, and this is the language that increasingly the uh, agricultural industry is talking about, opportunities for below ground carbon storage, these perennial uh, uh, features on the landscape that aren't annually cropped, have an opportunity to develop below ground carbon storage in the root systems of these plants or above ground in, 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 in tree uh, tissue. Water quality and regulation, habitat supporting services, all the good things that could happen in these messy places. But there's also bad things that could happen. And this is what farmers tell me, they're scared about what might happen. There might be, as they say, spillover of weeds that are allowed to grow unfettered in these spots or pests that can uh, sp uh, use part of that, these uh, fulfill part of their life cycle in these areas and then go out and reduce the uh, productivity of your crop and cost you money. So there's risks, disservices, as well as services, potentially. Now, what we did was, is we went out to try and figure out to measure these things. And we did this across Alberta starting in 2015. And here's what a typical field day might look like for our field team. And we went to about 335 sites across Alberta. You can see on the left there, all the red dots uh, up as far as Grand Prairie and scattered up, up as far as many of you folks near Edmonton, down south of Calgary across uh, uh, as far as Brooks and then down to Lethbridge. Um, and the 335 sites were both within fields and uh, near fields, sampling all across all sorts of gradients we used. And we got actually well over 200,000 arthropods across nearly 9,000 trap weeks of sampling from 25, 2015 to 2019. And the results I'm gonna present all come out of this beneficial insect surveillance network that we were funded by several groups to do. And this is what our work looks like. It looks like a lot of little pin things. Uh, for, from the perspective of bees, it's this beautifully furry uh, bumblebee. You'd almost want to pet it. Uh, and then this green bee or this orange bee or this blue bee. Who knew we had bees that were so colorful and so furry in Alberta? Indeed, we have about 300 species, uh, well, well, more than 300 species of bees. Um, including the ubiquitous honeybee, which is not, which is introduced, non-native, uh, and then um, uh, lots of other species of uh, spiders and beetles that we tracked in our process. So my big question now is, how do messy places work? And that's where I'm going to take you through next, is evidence to suggest that if a farmer were to choose to remove part of her field from production, these are the kinds of opportunities that are there and these are the kinds of uh, processes at work. And this isn't just me talking, we, this is our research, and that's why I'm gonna take you through this. So, um, 
the argument I'm going to make is that messy places like, for, for example, the green area around this wetland, or maybe it's a patch of trees, um, they're going to, if we retain them, in other words, we don't allow the uh, allow landowners to to or we re request that landowner uh, landowners don't remove them uh, or we restore them or we create new ones for example through this precision conservation process we have opportunities to deliver additional pollination and pest control and ultimately to increase crop yield and profit so it's an example of a of a study that was nested in that bigger design i mentioned just a couple of slides ago we went to uh, to focal wetlands across the region, like this one here in this field. We set up stations near that wetland. We also set up uh, control sites, if you like, at a ditch right next to the edge of the uh, of the field. And here's a rough idea of what our infield sampling business looked like. So here we are trying to ask: Who are the denizens of these messy places? Who lives there? Uh, are they reservoirs? So um, just to take you through some of these, these pictures. So along this axis, this is data. Uh, along this axis, we're gonna have time. So this is the, the day of the year. This would be uh, earlier in the uh, growing season. This would be late August. And on this axis, we've got the number of animals. So the number of bees. So um, here's an example of a, um, a mining bee, Andrina, Andrina amphibola. This is a solitary bee that makes its nest uh, in the ground. And you can see that uh, this is, um, uh, the green line is uh, sites near fields, the ditch sites, and the blue line is sites right beside a wetland. So this bee, for example, um, you know, across the season is found far more often near fields, not in fields. Uh, this green bee, this uh, uh, sweat bee, as it's called, is found more often also near fields than uh, in wetlands, and that varies across the season. Uh, this other bee as well, same pattern. So these bees generally found more commonly near fields, not in fields. But in contrast, some other interesting bee species in Alberta, uh, this Melisodes rivalis, uh, found more commonly uh, at wetlands than near fields. Or uh, this beautiful burying, uh, this, this uh, digging bee here, Anthophora, also found at certain times of the season more commonly by wetlands. And this other cactus bee, um, cactus bee, uh, also found more commonly in these um, uh, near wetlands where presumably its uh, host was able to grow. So, um, or, or its, its uh, mutualist plant is able to grow. So, uh, solitary so variation here in the importance of these infield features for bees. So, solitary bees are small bodied and they typically do not travel far from the nest. So, in some cases, these, uh, these uncultivated places right in the middle of the field are an opportunity for ground nesters. So, in effect, like a reservoir. Social bees like this furry, big, beautiful bumblebee uh, are much larger bodied and they can travel much greater distances. So they are colonial, more like when we think of honeybees. Uh, they have a big colony, uh, but bumblebees are similar in that they have much smaller colonies, but um, they, 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 uh, they, they would deal with the landscape in a different way. And we found evidence for what I would call an aggregator effect of these infield uh, non-crop messy places. So something like the honeybee, this is the one that people bring to the landscape by putting colonies up, Apis mellifera, um, really the, there was variation across the season. They were found both in wetlands and the ditch, a little bit more commonly near fields in the ditch than in fields. But what about uh, uh, this very common red belted bumblebee found more commonly in the ditch than in wetlands? Uh, and also for this other common bumblebee. But in contrast, these bumblebees, Bombus borealis, at certain times of the year found more commonly uh, in wetlands, uh, or uh, this beautifully this huge bumblebee, Bombus nevadensis, or Tenarius, or this uh, bumblebee, which is on the verge of being listed uh, nationally as a species at risk, Bombus occidentalis, found more commonly at wetlands. So depending on the species, these infield features may be very important, and that varies across the year. Time matters, space matters, and what farmers do can help these important vectors, if you like, of pollination service. So if we retain, we restore, and we create messy places, we can deliver pollination services. What about uh, 
what about, let's take that further now and talk about how this might help farmers. And we call that phenomenon a spillover effect. You know, animals that might be hanging out in the green area surrounding this messy feature, they might bubble up to the surface like a pot that's boiling and then spill over around the sides and then flow out into the field. Uh, and if we have more, if that pot is bubbling, bubbling more, and there's more animals there, they're going to spill out a bit further into that, into the crop, where they're going to go do good stuff, like maybe pollinate the crop. Uh, if you're canola, for example, it might benefit to have a little bit of pollination. Or if you are an animal that provides pest control, you can get into that crop and eat the bad guys. So for example, let's talk about pest control for a second. Here's some beetles that are hanging out at the edge of the field in this beautiful illustration by my, my student, uh, graduate student, Tobin Neem. I'll be showing some of their other uh, images in this talk and um, showing here how the beetles leave the habitat at the edge of the field and they march into the crop and then they uh, lunch, if you like, they dine on the bad guys. Um, I'm going to show you some slides now, some evidence, uh, and they're all going to look very similar to this, all the different graphs. I'm going to just take you through those graphs. So along the x-axis, we have the distance from the edge, and that, by that I mean right at the edge of, of this of this feature here that is a messy feature that the farmer might choose to retain in his crop. And then as we go out here on the x-axis, it's the distance, so moving out deeper into the crop. And on this axis, this is the number of animals or the amount of service that we're gonna get. So more service, less service. So let's say we sampled at a lot of places in a crop field, if we were seeing spillover, we might expect to see this pattern, that as you move away from the edge of a feature like this, you're going to get a, a lot right at the edge, but you're going to get fewer as you move into the field. That's what That pattern we call spillover, and I'm going to show you some data that suggests it's operating in many fields, like for bumblebees, I've already mentioned them, but are these pollinators spilling over into the crop? Are they getting to where potentially the canola might benefit from their services? Uh, and indeed, here's the pattern we're looking for for spillover more near the edge, fewer into the field would suggest spillover. And indeed, in the late season, not so much in the early season, bumblebees are spilling over. We see that signal. Uh, indeed, for 132 other species in this sort of uh, multi-species analysis that we published in 2019, um, we found a similar pattern in crop fields. We found the spillover signal, but, in, but as we would expect, where bees could nest anywhere, there was no limitation to where on the landscape they could nest in uncultivated pastures, we did not find that relationship. So if you like a control, um, what about for the animals that do the pest control work, the hungry natural enemies like Terosticus melanarius? We'll talk about this beetle again in a minute. Do we see spillover? Is it, does it have anything to do with these uh, near field, these marginal areas, these places that the farmer might choose to conserve? Um, indeed, we find a, sim a signal of spillover in the early season, not so much in the late season. And indeed this paper by my postdoc, Sam Robinson, demonstrated that time matters a great deal to where this hungry beetle is in the field. Spiders as well, in the late season, they tend to spill over from these areas. So what this tells us is that these natural enemies, these predators of crop pests, depend at least for part of their life cycle on these parts of the fields that the farmer might choose to retain, restore, or through precision conservation, create. So again, we've got evidence that there's potential spillover of pollination and pest control, that these areas can be home to animals we might care about. And these parts of the fields here are less home to these animals. So there's some hot spot here, and this hot spot might provide a service. We need to go a bit further though, if the animals are getting into the field, are they doing anything we care about there? Let's just focus on pest control for a second, because we spent the most time looking at that. If these beetles or these spiders or these harvestmen, these, crew, these, these arthropods that head out into those fields and have lunch, are they actually dining on animals that farmers might care about? 
We had two ways to do that, and we call this process sentinel prey. It's where we stick objects of potential prey into the fields, and we look for evidence that these arthropods, these insects and spiders, are have the potential to dine on stuff. So um, this, I'm showing unpublished data here uh, on the part of uh, two graduate students, Tobin Neem and Sylvia Jensen, and they've both been very kind in allowing me to present their as yet unpublished and undefended work on their behalf. So I wanna say thank you very much to them for allowing me to do that. Um, so this, uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, Tobin has done is they've, they've gone out into the field and they've, they've put these plasticine caterpillars out, uh, these little uh, th uh, three centimeter long bits of plasticine, and then uh, they go back and they check to see is there any evidence that of bite marks. And indeed all these little, you can, maybe you can see them if you look closely, uh, these little, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're bite marks. And we know that these are the bite marks of, of beetles, actually, because we put a whole bunch of beetles in a little room and a little and put a bunch of these caterpillars on and they tried to dine on these caterpillars. So they are good sentinels, if you like, of, of predation. Um, what Sylvia did is she stuck these egg cards out into fields. And these are moth eggs. They're dead moths, eggs. But we stuck to these cards. And then after six hours, she went back to see how many eggs were left and she measured the difference in the area. I'm gonna show you the results of that work. So first to Tobin's um, dining on plasticine caterpillars. And indeed, remember this is our evidence of spillover, more close to the edge, fewer further away. And um, when you do that, when you see a, when you look about cater, uh, caterpillar uh, dining as, as a function of the distance from the edge, uh, we saw this weak uh, relationship here suggesting that there's more dining happening a bit closer to the edge and further into the field. And indeed, I'm not showing that here, but this varied across the season. And this is with a very large sample of almost a thousand caterpillars and uh, 300 sites in, uh, in 20 fields. Um, what uh, Sylvia did is that uh, she uh, did a similar kind of study, um, uh, 900 egg cards in um, uh, a smaller number of fields, but um, also found this, this, this decay relationship, if you like, as you move away from the edge of the field. So what she did is she, she counted the proportional difference in the area left after six hours of uh, sticking these egg cards in the field. And she, did, uh, uh, and she found, of course, great variability, but this general trend that as you move out further into the field, you're getting less and less predation. And of course we care about eggs because eggs of moths in particular uh, are the source, uh, are, are, are the cause of many um, outbreaks of pests in fields in, in Alberta. So it might matter. And here we've also stuck some GoPros out into the field to see what was actually eating those eggs. So, so here's, some of, here's a video from Sylvia's work, it's short. Look at that, Terosticus melanarius, that beetle dining on eggs. There it goes. And indeed, almost all of our GoPro uh, images that we caught um, of animals dining on eggs were this beetle. So this strongly su suggests that this highly abundant beetle in Alberta, Terosticus melanarius, doesn't really have a common name. It's introduced, uh, it was introduced to North America in the uh, early 1920s on both the East and West coasts of North America. And it's not considered invasive, but it's highly abundant. And we don't have any evidence that's displacing any natural um, uh, species, although, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, uh, any um, uh, non-introduced species. Um, but we do have a, a sense that it's actually contributing, particularly in agricultural areas. So um, uh, I'll say that again, 90% of the egg predators that we caught uh, on video were this beetle. We have no evidence it harms crops. It's everywhere. It's abundant. It predates on many pest species, and a lot of work in our lab is to try and unpack that further. It may, it is omnivorous. It might even eat weed seeds. Uh, and if farmers want to keep it in this field, we have to convince them not to till because it lays its eggs in the soil. Um, but back to our pest to service question, you know, we, if farmers were to conserve, do some precision conservation, leave these areas on their fields uh, um, and remove them from production to save money, remember that's our premise from the start, if they were to do this, uh, would there be a risk? 
would those areas harbor pests? Would they spill over into their fields and cause trouble? Well, um, this is unpublished work uh, also by um, uh, a, a former student of mine, Rebecca Innes, who has also uh, incidentally moved on to the University of Alberta now doing her master's there. I wanna thank her for allowing me to present uh, this, this work. Uh, and uh, Rebecca's work shows that um, for, at least for the pests we care about, caterpillars, ligus bugs, and flea beetles, um, there is no evidence that they really are more abundant at all in these non-crop areas. So sure enough, yes, they're abundant in crops, but it has nothing to do with uh, areas that are uncultivated beside the fields. Leafhoppers, yeah, but leafhoppers aren't really an important pest. So I'll just leave that there. So if we were to map the spillover effect to try and understand which parts of a farmer's field get the most service from uh, these uncultivated areas. So uh, these, these are internet maps produced by my graduate student Tobin, and the red areas suggest areas where we have more service. So here's a standard central Alberta quarter section. There's no mess here at all. And you can see uh, the ditches around the edge potentially are providing service. These uh, field edge, field margin places are providing some service uh, at a certain distance into the crop. And this much messier field here, uh, theoretically speaking, would, uh, would there'd be a lot more opportunity for service. Now, of course, you show this map on the right to a farmer and they say, well, there's a lot less crop there. Uh, so I'm gonna be making a lot less money. Of course, this is an extreme example, but the point is, that the more mess you have in the field, the more opportunity you have to get service sourced from that edge. And that's the main point. So if we retain, restore, and we recreate through precision conservation messy places, we have the potential to deliver pest control services, pollination services to the crop. We have the potential to keep these animals on our landscape. But what about bottom line? You know, we've talked about bottom line in terms of, well, if you don't cultivate an area that isn't productive, we're going to save money. But is there additional opportunities for profit? Let's look at those. So we've got the spillover effect. What happens if the animals that spill over are actually helping the yield by, let's say, eating the pests? Are they going to improve the yield of the surrounding crop or by pollinating the canola, are they gonna slightly boost the yield of that crop, make larger seeds, make more seeds in your canola? We call that effect a halo effect. If these areas are having an effect on crop yield, if we look at crop yield in the, across the entire field, we might expect to see halos, slightly higher areas, regions that have more uh, yield in them because those areas are contributing a service to the farmer's bottom line. So thankfully, I mentioned this already at the beginning, precision yield data is our friend, it can help. And indeed we use that in two papers, um, uh, Agriculture, Ecosystems and Environment, and also another in Precision Agriculture. What we did is we uh, took precision yield data and we built models combining it with Sentinel-2 imagery. This is imagery of the world, uh, taken from space. And in particular, we focused on 757 canola fields near Vermilion, Alberta. That's uh, um, east of Edmonton towards the Saskatchewan border. And each of those yellow fields, we used a model to predict the yields of these fields from space by combining precision yield with satellite imagery. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can check out those papers. Basically, we're figuring predicting yield from space. So uh, for example, here's the raw data from the harvesters. And then if we look at how well we can uh, predict the yield in that same field from space, yeah, you know, we don't perfectly predict all this variability, but we get some major trends from space, just using space only data from the satellite. And certainly we can find this lower uh, productivity area. And on average across those fields, our error rate was about 12% on yield. So, I mean, you know, it's not perfect, but we're still getting, we still have the capacity to examine trends uh, from space in yield using model. So did we find halos? Well, uh, uh, Lan a postdoc of mine, um, did, uh, did find evidence of halos. For example, in canola yield, uh, evidence of um, a higher region of yield at a certain distance 
from uh, the edge. So uh, what we see, this green area, uh, we might we would translate to the halo. The reason why we see low yield right at the edge, so this kind of uh, ha halo rather than a continuous region of high yield is right at the edge of the fields. We expect lower yield due to exposure or soil compaction. Uh, farmers know that right at the edge of the field, crops don't never do as well. So if there is an effect, we expect to see it close to the edge, but not right at the edge. So that's the pattern we saw. It's not a perfect story. Uh, indeed, um, we also found that you only will get this yield boost if the fields around you are not are less messy. So if you're in a district that's already very messy, you're not going to see such the same yield boost as if you're in a district that are in a, a context that is substantively less messy. So that's a subtle point. But I think generally speaking, messy can be good, but balance is best. There's a limit to this yield halo effect. And to be perfectly frank, it's not going to make you a lot of money. We're talking, you know, uh, dollars, uh, single unit dollars per acre in terms of this effect. So it's not, it's, it's mostly about evidence that there can be a positive and not a negative effect on your crop. It's not going to be uh, necessarily an economically important decision. But nonetheless, important evidence that these areas are providing a service. And that's where it matters most. But you know, we, we took a more broader scale example at doing this and we used, got some insurance data for all the fields across Alberta from the primary insurance provider in Alberta, AFSC. We got 60 million seeded acres for um, uh, 420 varieties of canola, wheat, barley, pea and oat. And we looked at each municipal district uh, in a, you know, a, a, a model that asked whether um, there was a relationship between how messy that district was as a whole and how much yield its crops produced. Controlling for things we would know differ across this huge area, like you know, soil and climate. I mean, massive differences. So we're controlling for those things in our model, but uh, asking is there still a signal of uh, you know, messiness on yield. And indeed, not taking even to the model results, we found uh, evidence for that across these five crops. Uh, the largest effect I, I actually was interestingly in oat. Um, but the main message is that the halo effect is real and up to a point, and you can read the paper if you want to understand that point, it pays for itself. So if you take land out of production, that resulting area surrounding that uh, is going to have a slight boost in yield and it's going to pay for, it's gonna be a break even prospect up to a point. Now, obviously if your entire field is covered in mess, you're not gonna lose, you're gonna lose money on that, but there is evidence for a break even at a certain point. So my argument again, we retain, we restore, we create messy places on fields, potential to deliver pollination and pest control, potential to keep those animals on our landscape. If we can convince farmers to do precision conservation, to make new areas where they are already losing money, we can have these advantages and potentially they might not, they might actually gain on surrounding area of field. Back to the initial idea for this talk, precision conservation can it lead to precision sustainability. At the start of the talk, I made the point that we can, um, uh, combine harvesters out there on the field are collecting one data point about yield every second during harvest. And if we can get that information from farmers, we can use the other methods I talked about uh, to build models. We can combine satellite information with um, uh, information about seeding rate and fertilizer and crop yield and economic data. And we can roll out predictions. We can use the power of the satellite and the power of our on the ground data to make longitudinal predictions for huge areas of the prairies about parts of farmers' fields that have an opportunity for precision conservation. And that very idea is the idea behind a network we started here called the Prairie Precision Sustainability Network. It's a research network um, where um, my lab here at the University of Calgary combined with three other labs at the University of Saskatchewan. We're working to roll this kind of precision conservation prediction out across the entire prairies. 
Um, we, uh, we've got, um, and our, our, what we do is we have two uh, full-time folks working with us uh, who are interfacing with farmers to crowdsource data from those farmers, this precision ag data. We now have close to half a million acres of data from across Saskatchewan and Alberta that we are now using to build these models, to roll out maps that will allow land use decision makers to support decisions about which parts of their land could be removed from production at a savings. And that's the key piece. If we can tell farmers which parts of their field they could remove at a savings to them, we unlock a whole series of opportunities regarding biodiversity, ecosystem services, and potentially higher yield. So uh, if anyone's interested in, in learning more about the Prairie Precision uh, Sustainability Network that we're leading here at the University of Calgary uh, with folks in Saskatchewan, please check out prairiepsn.ca uh, and that, um, that uh, QR code will take you there. So with that, I want to conclude and say um, thank you to the many people in the field who have uh, supported this data collection uh, in the lab, particularly the work of those I've underlined here have been leaders in, in the work I'm presenting. And uh, also thank you to our many uh, funders, in particular Canola Council and Ducks Unlimited. Uh, ECCC, Environment and Climate Change Canada, has also been a highly influential funder in our Prairie Precision Sustainability Network. Um, and uh, I thank them too. And with that, I'd be pleased to take some questions. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Paul Galpern, for such an amazing presentation. I personally really enjoy learning more about the spillover effect, the halo effect, and also just seeing the evidence that you provided um, when you did the testing of these effects. So thank you so much for sharing all of that information. Now we will open it up to the Q&A. I see this quick question about the presentation. So just a note, we are recording this session and once edited, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel that you can find the link to on our website. So yeah, so stay tuned for that. And, and feel free to get in touch with me directly if you'd like some more information on that. Uh, you can find me at the email address at the bottom of the screen. Uh, shall I respond to that question in the chat? Okay, so the question is, um, from a perspective of implementation, how open are we to finding producers and crop, how open are producers and crop commissions to these ideas? Um, yeah, we've had a lot of, of, of positive feedback um, from producers. I speak frequently to producers about this work. Um, crop commissions, um, we have uh, spoken to Canola Council about this work. Um, they are, they, they haven't funded us to do the sustainability network, um, but they're certainly very interested in what we've done, at least uh, uh, off record. So I think there's 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 a growing interest um, in the work uh, that uh, to, to roll this out. Uh, I think the industry as a whole um, is very much aware that sustainability issues are coming down the pipeline um, in order to market our crop to the rest of the world. We need to demonstrate that we are considering sustainability in all we do. Uh, and of course, carbon, carbon uh, storage and sequestration in these perennial features that we might um, conserve through precision conservation or retention or restoration, that is also on everybody's tongue when it comes to, um, to this work. And then finally, uh, producers, uh, you know, as I say, we've got a whole bunch of producers who've actually signed on with their data to support this work uh, uh, all across the prairie. So there are, um, you know, initially we thought we might get 2% uh, of those producers we contact willing to share data, but it's closer to 50% of those we contact. So, I mean, certainly there's a, there's a, there's a segment of people that, that are not willing to engage uh, with this, but there is a large percentage of people are. So I hope that is some data to support what I've said. Thank you for answering that question. Um, the next question we have is, how can this be effective in countries where land holdings are marginal, like India? Smaller fields and farmers hesitate to leave bare land. 
And then there's a follow-up to that. What about use of pesticides on halo effects? Okay. Uh, so um, question about uh, agricultural, um, where, where, where land holdings are much smaller. You know, clearly, um, so the, the first thing to state is, thank you for that question. Very, very interesting um, to try and think about the implications of this work beyond uh, the prairies. Um, I, I think the first thing I would say is that uh, I, I would not want this work to be interpreted um, beyond this landscape. I think that one of the things we know about landscape ecology uh, is that there, are, although there may be some um, general theoretical principles that operate across the world, many of our findings are very place-based and time-based. So I think the first thing would be general caution. However, uh, I think to add to that, some of the general patterns I'm describing have been discovered in a European and in Asian agroecosystems. So they're not, they're not by any means unique to them. Um, but I think the issues uh, that are at play, for example, for much smaller uh, uh, landholders are, are very different. Um, and, um, you know, uh, ecosystem, and also in, in, in landscapes that are much more productive, um, the, the distance from the field edges may, may also matter less. So that's not a very satisfying answer for you, I'm sorry to say, but I, I've done my best. Um, the, the next question is about, about the use of pesticides on halo effects. Um, so I think it's, uh, uh, so the use of pesticides, of course, uh, uh, farmers may often use pesticides when there is an indication of, of pests in their fields. Uh, sometimes it may be preventative, but other times it may be in response to an outbreak. Um, you know, certainly uh, pesticides are going to have an effect on beneficial insects and um, their undue use is going to reduce any positive effect that those beneficials may have on the crop. Um, we don't have, uh, we have some evidence that insecticides like seed, um, seed coatings, so many insecticides are actually a, uh, included in the seed, uh, things like neonicotinoids, um, we know that those have an impact on bees. Um, spraying of pesticides, um, it's complex. Uh, and certainly spraying of pesticides on, on uh, beneficial pest control species, um, you know, likely to have an effect, for, for example, in Terostochus melanarius and reduce its hungry dining on the crop pests. So, you know, certainly, certainly risks, certainly risks. Um, but where that balance exists, we certainly need more research. Certainly we're not going to suggest that farmers cease spraying, the impacts on that, on um, their production could be substantive. But finding that balance point is certainly worth it. Qu next question is, how do you view and value the annual, for example, flower strip versus perennial forest island hedges? You know, these different types of messes. Could we, you know, there's certainly a lot of work um, now on the prairies and elsewhere in North America. Excellent question, thank you. Uh, in which we make um, sort of uh, prairie strips in which we plant uh, annual plants, or we, uh, in other places where we retain more woody vegetation or, or shrubs, or for example, the image you're seeing on the screen in front of you, these wooded wetlands um, near uh, south of Edmonton, you know, um, which, which do we choose? Uh, I don't think it's a case of which we choose. I think we need to do all of these things. Uh, and, and how do we value them in comparison uh, I think we need definitely more research because an apple, uh, these are apples and oranges. Um, we have evidence that all of these things are, um, you know, have some contribution to make. Uh, when is that contribution? Time certainly matters. Where is that contribution? In the prairies, that certainly matters. The size of these patches, the quality of these patches, these are all factors that we are only beginning to untangle and there is a great depth of research needed. But for the time being, I would say, let's do them all and use that as an opportunity to test uh, their variability and their, uh, their power. Um, shall I continue? Uh, yes, yes. Our next question is from Tracy. They said you talked about insects quite a bit, but if land is being taken out of production, aren't weeds a concern, at least until establishment of non weedy vegetation? I could see herbicide use being necessary, which may affect your economic analysis and the sustainability angle. 
Yes, excellent point. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so, uh, you know, um, the the notion of let, let I think you go back to this precision conservation idea that we're taking parts of the field out of production. How do we transition that to a uh, hot spot? Um, and there is a period of transition. Um, we could call that the restoration process. We could call that, uh, you know, um, there are there, there are many who are expert in that conversion process, Ducks Unlimited being an example, uh, lots of experience of how do we take land out of production and we convert it to these stable um, habitats that are, uh, um, you know, perennial or, or uh, unharvested. Um, it's a process and that itself does need research in addition to what, what Ducks Unlimited already knows about that space. So yes, yeah, certainly there are going to be expenses and herbicide may be part of that equation. Um, you know, and including that in at least the short term economic analysis is, is important. Thanks for that question. Our next question is, does your work consider farm machinery field efficiency economics for farmers in maintaining or not maintaining the messy areas? Also, how business risk management programs for crop producers may impact these decisions? Thanks, Roger, for that, that question. Um, so certainly we, we are working as part of our Prairie Precision Sustainability Network. Um, and in case anyone's watching, maybe I'll stick that slide back up again. Um, as part of this uh, Prairie Precision Sustainability Network, we are working with Tristan Skolrud at the University of Saskatchewan. He is a um, agricultural economist. So um, his modeling, if you like, uh, if you want to go back to this part, uh, this part of our story, if you like, um, definitely considers uh, all of these, these additional costs that farmers are undertaking. Uh, so certainly that's part of it. Um, uh, so uh, business risk management programs for crop producers may impact these decisions. And I think these, these, these are all economic layers, if you like, as well, uh, that, that are part of Tristan's analysis. Um, certainly that the initial phase of our work, though, and, and that's really the only part I've, I've presented in detail, is this, um, this, this uh, connection of yield and satellite imagery to start to beginning to identify the spatial opportunities. But understanding their profit uh, implications is a much more complex economic modeling activity that, uh, that, that Tristan is engaging in and, 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 and starting to unpack. So I hope that answers your question. I believe those are all the questions we have for today. Thank you so much for answering all our questions and thank you for attending the session. Uh, thank you for being such an engaging audience today. Uh, stay tuned for that recording that will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. I am dropping the link to our YouTube channel in the chat box. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And once again, thank you so much for such an engaging presentation. Dr. Paul Galpin. And thank you so much for having me and thank you for coming to watch it. <laughs>